Hello everyone, this is Fernando for Godzilla Movie News. For this video, I'd like to continue the theme that I had started with my other video, this time reviewing another Godzilla movie that um, I have seen and I wanted to talk about here. Uh, for this one, I'd like to do the Godzilla 1998 movie that was associated with Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich and offer my thoughts on the film and analyze what worked and what didn't on there. First off, a brief little history about the movie itself. The movie was started um, shortly after the success of Independence Day. Um, it looked like Columbia Studios was looking for a summer blockbuster to work with, and seeing how well Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich's Independence Day film did, they had approached and were negotiating with Toho Studios to try to bring Godzilla as a franchise over to the U.S., and um, what happened was Toho Studios was actually championed um, several different studios at the same time. They were presenting various offers on where they were going to take Godzilla, and Toho listened to Columbia Studios, and they at that point were offering Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich's standpoint. And what sealed the deal with Toho Studios was there was one statue that the creative technical consultant for the film, the guy that designed pretty much all the visual effects and how they would look as far as the monster design, the trucks, and so forth, um, was a guy named Patrick Totopoulos. Um, if that name sounds familiar, it's because, of course, it's uh, the, the main character by Matthew Broderick. His name is an homage to that designer. And this uh, statue that you'll see here is actually the statue that won the studio, Toho Studios' heart. They liked the design on Godzilla, contrary to popular belief. They liked it up front enough to okay it. And this was something that sealed the deal uh, with Columbia Studios and everything else with Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich. So they got the okay to go forward with that. And Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich were very happy because they wanted to do something that was even bigger than Independence Day itself. And I remember reading quotes stating that uh, I think it was Roland Emmerich that said, how much bigger can you get than Godzilla himself? So interesting to read that they wanted to make sure that they could do bigger than Independence Day by going with Godzilla. And the design again itself, that statue that I was talking about just a couple of seconds ago, that one was again okayed by Toho Studios up front. They did put a little bit of recommendations to the two guys. Um, asking if they could make sure that Godzilla's uh, dorsal fins were more prominent. Maybe they could do something about uh, some of the design, like on the chin, or adding the fire breath, or atomic breath, I'm sorry, and that's how it went from there. So the, what, the, what troubled the movie itself was that there was actually a very short time period for them to work with. When they finally got the okay, from Toho Studios, they only had about a little over a year from start to finish to work on this. Uh, probably at most about a year and a half, but closer to around a year for this. Anytime we have a big summer blockbuster, there's has to be at least a year and a half up to two years worth of time from start to finish in order to make sure that the film goes well, that it's not hurried, that there's not any late decisions that can't be canceled, stuff like that. But in their case, they had about almost a year and a half to a little year to work on this. And I'll explain a little bit what that means afterward. So they started the movie, they got the casting, they decided to go forward with um, a similar plot line to Independence Day. I mean, when you compare the two, it's a uh, geek slash scientist of sorts that saves the day, uh, that works with the military to ensure that they can stop this uh, threat, in this case Godzilla, from spreading over the earth, um, and then ensuring that at the same time he has an old love interest that goes back into his life, um, and reconciling and making sure that uh, at the end everybody's happy. He even has a buddy in the lines of a military figure, in this case being the John Reno character, much like in Independence Day when Jeff Goldblum's character had a buddy of sorts going with Will Smith's character. So you can see a lot of the similarities on that part too. Now the Godzilla movie was finished and later shown uh, through the Madison Square Garden, which I thought was a brilliant move at the time. Um, what culminated to that was a huge marketing effort, the largest one ever, really. 
uh, for such a movie like that. This was a marketing effort that started almost a year before. They actually cut a teaser trailer. I'm sure many of you, just like me, saw it in the theaters when Men in Black first came out. That showed a teaser of what Godzilla was going to be like when he stomped in on that Tyrannosaurus Rex model that was in that museum. And it was interesting to see that because this was the same time, I don't even think the movie was even started at that point, that they shot this teaser beforehand, which again goes to show credit to the marketing team at that point. Um, they may not have had much time over on the movie to make it work, but they were already thinking about marketing styles. Now, here's where I start dissecting what works and what doesn't about the movie. What works were the special effects. Uh, one thing that Dean Emelin and Roland Emmerich can do very well with their movies is special effects. I mean, they can make a movie a blockbuster all around. Uh, watching this movie, even now, to this day, you can still see the effect that they had on it. I mean, this is a true sense of the blockbuster in every word. Uh, these are the type of summer movies that other summer movies wish they could be because of the size, the magnitude, uh, the quote-unquote event that this movie becomes. That's what works very well. Special effects still hold up in most cases to this day. There are a few scenes that have a little bit, you know, squeamish kind of CGI going on, but other scenes that work very, very well, such as when Godzilla is... Uh, first feasting on the fish. There are several shots of him as he approaches it, and they look very real. Or when Godzilla is uh, submerged in the water, being chased by the submarines, I felt that worked very well as well. Or when he's chasing, in fact, the trio, or, or I'm sorry, the quadruple and the taxi later on at the end of the film, some of those shots were amazing, completely outstanding. And again, the effects overall work very well because Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich they know how to stretch a dollar. I mean, it, uh, I read that the budget on this movie was about $135 million, which um, is actually fairly lower than most summer blockbusters should be, but it makes it look like two or three times as much in that movie. I mean, a lot of it was shot actually in New York. No Canadian or Australian location looking to resemble New York in this case. This was actually done in New York, which cost a boatload of money to do so, considering the um, unions and the rights that they have to obtain, but they did it. So my hat's off to them. Um, the effects made sure they did a very well job in and made it the event that it should have been. What works also very well was that the casting, I thought, worked really good. I mean, you have, it's again the same formula that they were following with regards to Independence Day. Um, I thought that all the main characters were very cohesive, and that they, they were very, uh, played off well off of each other, such as the two reporters, in this case, um, Maria Pitalos and Hank Azera's character, and then, of course, Jean Reno and Matthew Broderick's characters. I thought they all played very well off of each other. It did get a little goofy at some, to at some points, but I never felt that it was awkward in any other items like that. And that that's, again, what I felt made Independence Day a really good success, was the fact that a lot of the characters played well off of each other and uh, definitely worked here as well. And then what also worked very well, I felt, was the design of Godzilla himself. Now, what I'm stating is that the design as a revised, updated, modern version works well if you're not completely paying, uh, it's, if you're not completely stating that Godzilla is as that model. Instead, it's more like an homage of sorts. What I, what I mean is that the fact that if you took the name Godzilla off and just made it a monster movie, that works very, very well. Much like Cloverfield, the monster design of the uh, movie that came out a few years ago. It makes sense. The monster is upright, but it's more in the design of a dinosaur. Uh, the tail, instead of dragging it on the ground, is stretching side outwards. Um, Godzilla is leaning forward. It has um, arms that are actually workable that can pick up items. It has the ability to run very fast, to jump on buildings, uh, to swim underwater. Again, I thought the design worked very well for what it was. Now, as a Godzilla model itself, I don't believe it worked well. And, and that's where it leads to my discussion on what failed on the movie. Number one was the design as Godzilla himself. Again, that's where I felt it didn't work well because you shouldn't have put Godzilla as the name if you're going to so radically change the design itself. 
even paying homage to Godzilla through having the dorsal fin cell on there and maybe some semblance of the face, it it's either all or nothing, essentially. And in this case, I think that's what led to the film having such a huge drop-off in box office success was the fact that it was called Godzilla, but it was Godzilla and very little recognition only. Um, much like the moniker that's floating around now, Godzilla name only, that's what I felt here is what's going on too. Here you have a monster that says it's Godzilla, but looks nothing like it, but it has some of the designs on there as well. Um, in fact, I read an interesting article that I think it was on Barry's Temple of Godzilla or one of the other Godzilla fan sites where it analyzed that if the movie producers instead had put this design up front, so that way people got used to it over months and months before the movie came out, then it would have joined further success. Instead of hiding it in secret and having it come out as a surprise when customers or anybody movie viewers uh, saw it in the theater, then they felt that shock saying, what? You know, this is Godzilla? This, this monster that looks nothing Godzilla is supposed to be Godzilla? Instead, um, the article nicely surmised that if the monster design as is would have been shown much earlier than before, then people would have gotten used to it by the time the movie came out and would have accepted it further. And I think that's a good analyzation on that point. What also didn't work very well was the story. Um, as earlier I was describing about how Dean Devil and Ronald Emmerich were able to make a good event film, uh, actually make a great event film, what happened here was that it didn't take itself at the seriousness it should have. Um, there were certain points on there that were just too comical, too hokey. I mean, in particular, are the sub-characters of the Ebert and Siskel mayor and uh, mayoral aide. Uh, it's like, why? Why have that in there? If this would have been the same serious movie, the same serious tone that Independence Day would have been, then I think they would have enjoyed further success on that. And also what didn't work very well was the fact that there were a lot of ideas thrown in that kind of made Godzilla weird. Uh, what I mean is that Godzilla now lays eggs in that case. And then on top of that, Godzilla is a she-male of some sort. It's it, I know animals out there in the uh, world right now can procreate by themselves. It's just interesting to think that this was how Godzilla is going to be presented in the movie. And again, that became as a shock to most fans whenever they realized that, what, you know, Godzilla is having babies by itself and having eggs. It's more like a mother of sorts. These are the ideas that, while original and unique, at the same time in the Godzilla mythos, uh, were a large distraction on that. And um, it would have been something that instead should have been analyzed in another manner, maybe having Godzilla, uh, the eggs in the beginning of the movie, maybe having those eggs become Godzilla's mates and so forth, instead of just having Godzilla procreate by himself or herself. So in any case, that's my analyzation of the Godzilla 1998 movie. Um, as I had mentioned in one of my other videos, uh, there was going to be a sequel of sorts that was going to be produced. The furthest I got was the conceptual stage, which was just a script, a spec script of sorts, stating, not in detail, uh, not a script or anything, but stating in semi-detail what the movie was going to be about. But it was stopped because the studio didn't want to spend any more money. Uh, Dean Devil and Roman Emmerich wanted even further money on this movie than what the other budget was, and the studio wasn't just going forward with it. And so considering the lukewarm response that this movie got, the Godzilla 1998 movie, in terms of the box office, it was a success, but it wasn't the success the studio had hoped for. Then they decided to let the contract lapse on its own. So back in 2003, contract came and went with uh, Columbia Studios, and we never got the sequel as a result. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'll be producing more videos soon uh, with regards to latest Godzilla movie news, and, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, still talk about any further news that might come about soon with Gareth Edwards and so forth. Thank you very much.